There's a phrase that we hear quite often in our society, take it easy. You know, we probably used it ourselves at one time or another. But it does reflect the philosophy of our day and age that we want things easy, uh, that we just want to be able to sit back and take it all in, take it easy, without doing much at all. It was really the attitude of a rich man who went out, planted his gardens or his fields, reaped a great harvest. And then he, upon reaping that great harvest, said to himself, So, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now, that's in Luke 12 and verse 19. But later on, as Jesus continues with that parable, he calls this rich man a fool because of the attitude that he had. I'm going to just take my ease. In our society today, now, we have time-saving, work-saving gadgets galore. We have so many of them, we can't even keep up with them. And probably we all have, you know, drawers at home that you pull out and it's just overflowing with gadgets to save time. and all of them to make things easier on us. Life at one time in our land was very hard, very rugged. People didn't have any of those space, time, easy ways of doing things. And it took a great deal of effort for everything that they did. Today it's soft and easy on us. And that philosophy, though, has invaded us and affected every area of our lives. If it's not easy, then we don't really want it. Uh, let's do without it. If it takes great effort, then let somebody else do it. Because we want it easy. And we want our life easy. This attitude has certainly affected our political thinking. It's, uh, you know, if we look at our political realm today, we have difficulty finding the individual who would be considered a statesman today. Instead, it's cheap politicians that are going to tell people what they want to hear and provide people what they can give them in order to get elected. They are in a mad competition with each other to offer the greatest amount that they can to the voters that will vote, be voting for them and nothing else. That's a politician for you. And I'm not talking about political parties now because in reality, one political party is the same as another along that line nowadays. This one comes up and says, we'll give you such and such. And the other one comes along and says, we'll give you such and such. And sometimes they argue and fight about which one will cost more or less. 
but in reality, both of them are going to give you something in order to make your life easier for you, in order to just put something upon you. It's hard to find someone who's not like that anymore in our political realm. And when we do, generally what happens, they are voted out of office for rather quickly. And the politicians know that that's what happens to them. So what do they do? They offer more and more. And the politician, those who are in office, run on the fact, look at all that I've done for you. How many of them are going to be very successful by getting up and saying, well, I took all of these things away from you. No, they, they don't want to do that. They want to say, we've given you all these things. Past civilizations, as you go through history, though, have decayed and they've ended up perishing because the populace, the people, have become lazy, careless, and wicked. And those things generally go together. Our American heritage really stands in jeopardy because people today want to very simply take it easy. They love ease more than strength and more than pleasure, and it's pleasure more than God. Paul described it as he was writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and verse 4 when he describes people as being tra traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And he tells us from such withdraw ourselves from those type of individuals. They're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They want things easy for themselves. You look back at our history within our nation. You had men who were willing to pay a great price for the liberty that we have enjoyed through the years. Hard-working men with strong convictions. When I was watching uh, recently, uh, I think it was probably on the History Channel, I don't even know which one it was, The about the American Revolution. Uh, and it talked about the hardships of those men who under Washington and others were serving their country. And I thought of the difference between those type of men and today. Today, men of today would not have stood for it. They would not have engaged in it. They would have left, this is too hard, you cannot expect this from us. Because they went without, freezing, and yet didn't have proper clothing. They didn't have, they didn't have hardly anything. It's, and yes, we almost lost that war for freedom because of the lack of goods that those men had. Yet they were still, because of those strong convictions, willing to undergo those things in order for the freedom which we take for granted so many times. In our age, you come back to this age of ease that we have, and with it so many times goes the licentious living, the wickedness of, that we see within our society today. It's having a field day because people just want the easy way out. Uh, a nation that loses the philosophy of work and 
it's going to be destroyed. When you lose the philosophy of work, then you're going to need more courts, more jails, penitentiaries, and so forth, because the lack of work produces that very thing. Idleness increase, increases sin. And wickedness increases when people don't work and don't know how to work. And again, Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter in verse 13, says, And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. Now there he is talking about widows in particular, and how that they have quit working, basically. They're no long, they've learned to be idle. And because of that idleness, the sin increases. Whereas before, when they had a husband, they were working within the home and they didn't have time for the sin. It's always been known in order to prevent sin, put people to work. You get people working and they don't have time for the busybodiness, the backbiting, the griping and complaining that so many times is seen within congregations today. But you see the same thing in society. When you have idleness on the part of the people, wickedness increases. Why is it that, and we really see this uh, to a great extent within the inner cities, and these big cities, and all of the kids go out and they are idle, standing around on the street corners, and sin starts increasing, and wickedness and evil. Whereas, you know, years ago when some of y'all grew up, you know, two or three generations before me, uh, kids didn't have that opportunity because they were at home and had to work. God has always set forth the principle of labor, working. At the very beginning of time, as God created man, placed man in a beautiful garden, God expected man to work, though, even within that beautiful garden. Genesis 2 and verse 15, that the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and, and to keep it. God is giving an order. Here's what you have to do. Well, God, it's a beautiful garden. You've provided all of this for us. Can't we just sit back and enjoy it? No, you need to get to work and you need to dress it and keep it. You need to do the work that's necessary to keep it this way. God commanded man to work. In Genesis 3 and verse 19. Now then, we've had Adam and Eve committing sin. And God, in speaking to Adam, Eve, and the serpent, he says to man that in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground for out of it thou wast taken for dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. The sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. You're going to be able to eat when you work. Later on as Paul was writing to the Thessalonian brethren in, chap in the second letter that he wrote to them chapter 3 and verse 10 says that for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither let it, should he eat. So if you don't work, you don't eat. If you want to eat, then you have to work. That's the principle God has established. As God was giving his laws to the children of Israel, 
we call them the Ten Commandments, in particular in Exodus, the 20th chapter. We find the first three, and then we come to that fourth commandment, and we generally refer to it as remember the Sabbath. And we go on then. But there is more in remembering the Sabbath than just to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Notice in verse 9, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. In other words, God is just as much commanding man, the Israelites, to work as he is to rest. Sabbath day was, yes, a day of rest for them and also a day of worship for them. But while he commands that rest for the Sabbath day, he also says you have a command to work just as much as you have a command to rest. Six days shalt thou work. You're to do your labor during those days. We forget that aspect of the Ten Commandments. In fact, uh, I dare say that a lot of people who tout the Ten Commandments don't even know that part of the Fourth Commandment to remember the Sabbath day. It was a command to work as much as it is that man needs rest. Yes, and man does need rest at times. Our body, from a physical standpoint, needs to take rest at times. And so, yes, God was commanding them, you take rest because the body physically needs it, needs to recreate itself in that sense. That's what recreation is all about, recreation, recreation, recreating. It's taking, the, allowing the body to re, be reinvigorated. Well... That comes as a result of working. And so you work, you labor, God says, and then you rest. As we come to the New Testament, we see that the same principle is seen. We already mentioned St. Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, whereas man doesn't work, neither should he eat. But if you go back to Ephesians, the fourth chapter in verse 28, Paul would write, that let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he might have to give to him that need it. Here's a man who steals. He needs to stop the stealing and do what? Go to work. There is a clear indication that if he had been going to work and working with his hands, he would not have been engaged in the thievery. When you stop working, you start getting into trouble. And that's what our society continues to promote today. There have been, and we probably all know of multiple occasions where someone is offered a job today and they turn down the job because I can get more money from the government giving it to me than I can make by working for you. Why should I go work when they're going to give it to me? Uh, that's the attitude of this taking it easy attitude that is permeating our society. We so many times foster the attitude of non-working. But it's also invaded the realm of training and discipline of children. When we look at the school system many times, it's become more a place of play rather than to develop thinking and increasing of knowledge. In fact, the idea of critically thinking and increasing in knowledge is almost foreign to our school systems today. 
they spend more time, generally speaking, taking care of children than they do trying to teach them. Taking care of discipline problems, doing this, doing that, and there's no teaching that is done. So much so that there's now these radio hosts going out on the streets and finding kids many times, young people, and asking them questions and then putting those answers on the air because they're so hilarious and show such stupidity on the parts of those answers that it becomes funny for us. But it's sad in reality because our school systems has, have stopped teaching and stopped trying to get people to think critically. It becomes a great problem. It's very simply within the schools make life easy for them. Don't expect much out of them. And if they don't do very well, well, that's okay. Pass them on anyway. And now then we're seeing continually the push to, well, if they, you don't even tell them that they answer something wrong or incorrect, you might, you know, injure their psyche some way. So you don't tell them, this answer is wrong. Go back and redo it because it's wrong. No, we just let them glide on by, take the easy way out. Discipline within the school system is almost non-existent today, except to ship them off to another school. Those are the real bad troublemakers, and so we just ship them off there. But as far as discipline, most kids know nothing's going to happen, at least from the school system. And then we start wondering about our generation of softies who worship the ease and pleasure. Try and get some of these young people today to think about sacrifice hardship, and the ideas are totally foreign to them because all they have been fed their entire life is pleasure and ease. Within the home, we've seen the same thing, how much little discipline is exercised upon children. And many times, it's because parents want the easy way out. It's not so much the children's fault, it's the parents' fault because the parents want the easy way out. And the children recognize that and so they take advantage of it. Children are very, uh, they, they can sense those things. You know, if my parent doesn't want to give me something, then I throw a little fit and they'll give it to me to pacify me, make it easy on me, and I give what I want. And they thus know that, and they continue to act out until they give what they want. I mentioned a while ago, how many young people today are really required to do much work In fact, if you have them do too much work, then uh, government's liable to step in and say you shouldn't be doing that. We just hand everything to them. No sense of responsibility. We'll just give it to them, and that's it. And then we expect them to take care of it, and it costs them nothing. It's worth nothing to them in reality. Discipline, though, is required in regards to a parent and child relationship. Parents are to train up a child 
and the way that he should go when he is old, he will not depart from it. But there is a training that is to take place, an instruction. That's Proverbs 22 and verse 16. Instruction. But training also involves discipline. Disciplining that child so that he will do what is right. Proverbs 29 and verse 15 says that the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. There was a question that I got involved in this week as to, is it right to spank a child? And of course, there's individuals who pipe on and say, no, it's wrong. And when passages such as this are given, they just basically ignore it. The rod and reproof give wisdom. A child left to himself, though, where that discipline is not exercised, that corrective discipline, then he's going to get worse and worse and worse. Many children sensing the need really to have limits and to have something set for them where they can have that secure feeling. They will intentionally do things that are worse and worse, trying to get their parents to do something about it, and the parents take the easy way out of not doing anything. Instead of exercising the discipline that needs to be exercised. Paul would write in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, that ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, in training and in disciplining children, there has to be a positive discipline as well as a negative discipline. There has to be the reinforcement of that which is good and right. And there has to be the punishment of that which is wrong. Many times, when discipline is talked about, all that's talked about is the corrective discipline. There's the instructive discipline that also needs to be considered. Sometimes parents, all they want to do is the corrective discipline without ever doing the instructive discipline. The instructive discipline is, again, takes effort and time. And sometimes it's easier just to tell a child no, and if they then get into trouble, then to punish them. Instead of the instructive discipline that takes time and effort to teach them the right way. Both aspects, though, many times take work on the part of parents. But far too often, we want to pass it off, and we see parents wanting to pass it off to someone else or to ignore it and take the easy way out. Instead of doing what God requires parents to do. The easy way out, though, is destroying the home. And when it destroys the home, it also destroys the nation itself. But it's also having its effect upon the church. The lack of respect for authority. Why is a child that's brought up in a home that does not have the corrective discipline and the instructive discipline, what happens to that child? Generally, it has no respect. Doesn't have respect for the parents. And when they go to the school system, doesn't have res respect for the teachers and the administrators. When they get out in the world, they don't have any real respect for those who are their bosses. When you come to the church, they don't have respect for God nor for the congregation, for the elders of the congregation and as they oversee the work of the church. Why? Because the effects of the home. And that take it easy attitude by the parents that instilled within that child that same attitude and also a lack of respect for anything and everything including their own selves, 
then has its effect upon the church right away. And we have seen that within our society today and within the Lord's church today. Congregations will offer more and more programs and things in order to entertain and to provide recreation for people because that's what people want. How many congregations are going to say, well, we're going to provide you a whole bunch of work to do. And we expect you to do that work. We're, we're going to make it hard on you. We want to try and develop you to where you are a good Christian and that you can face the temptations that come your way. don't see that very much within the church of our Lord today because we want to spoon feed everyone and take the easy way out. And so it's destroying the church of our Lord as well. But we'll talk more about that, Lord willing, next Sunday afternoon. But God never expected us to take the easy way out. That's the fool's way. And yes, he expected us from a physical standpoint to work. From a spiritual standpoint, he expects us to work. We have been created, Paul would say in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, unto good works. And while in many religious groups work is a taboo idea, and sadly becoming such in many congregations of the Lord's church, God has instructed us to work. To be obedient to his will, that's good works to do what he says, and to engage in the activities that he wants us to be involved in. And yes, to stay away from those things that don't, that are sinful, wicked. But it takes effort on our part, work. And we have to become strong. Remember the passage that we read in Ephesians 6 chapter this morning about the soldier and the Christian armor? And how many times he says to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. But in order to be strong, you have to work, you have to exercise yourself so that you can build the strength. So that you can fight against the wiles of the devil. Now if you're not a Christian this afternoon, we would encourage you to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ. If you haven't lived the Christian life that you should be living. You realize that you want to come back and you want to repent of your sin and you want to make things right within your life so that you can live in an acceptable way to God and attain heaven's home. But you haven't been doing that. and You've allowed sin to enter into your life and we'll pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins and loving Heavenly Father stands waiting and willing always to forgive us, to cleanse us from all iniquity, and thus be his children and have the inheritance waiting us when we die or when Christ comes again. If you need to come this afternoon, then we encourage you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.